and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to March 1986 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. I play some games on my mobile phone. I review some older games. I take a look at a newer title. We give you some playing tips. We take a trip to Typing Corner. And end with my demo of the month. But first, it's back to March 1986. As time moves on and the more powerful 16-bit machines begin to become more popular, 8-bit news is starting to get less and less, and this means that I'm having to spread the news net a little wider. Luckily, your Sinclair magazine was launched in January of this year, and there are also a few other sources, which means we can carry on, at least for now. No sooner had Sinclair launched its much-anticipated micro, the Spectrum 1-8, than compatibility issues began to arise. It seems that although Sinclair tried to keep things compatible by including a 48k mode, some games just don't work. Several companies have already come forward and said that their games are just not compatible. Amongst them are Firebird, who have notified buyers that Elite would just not run in any mode on the machine. Software projects have advised players that BC's Quest for Tires doesn't work properly, and digital integration have also noted problems with Tomahawk. The issues seem to be an area of RAM just below screen memory that Sinclair have changed on the newer machine. Another issue affects the use of Kempston joystick adapters, causing several games to fail. Kempston are said to be aware of the problem and are looking into things. Sinclair are laying the blame with the software companies, saying that they made certain assumptions about the memory layout. All companies involved are working on patches or updates, so stay tuned. British Telecom continue on their mission of buying up small software companies and amalgamating them into its growing corporate network. The most recent acquisition is Odin Computer Graphics, producers of titles like Nodes of Yesod and Robin of the Wood. Odin will continue as a developer, with BT taking exclusive rights to the software and of course, a share in the profit. Could this be a new trend? The demise of the small independent companies with larger cash-focused corporations taking over. Sinclair have been beaten in the race to produce a disk drive system for the 128 machine. Clive Sinclair said last month that they would be working hard on such a device and it will be available shortly, but Opus have launched their own this month. The Opus Discovery provides a 3.5 inch double density drive that can store 259k of data. The unit also includes a parallel port and a joystick port and will cost £149.95. Sinclair have announced that their new Spectrum compatible portable computer, named the Pandora, will be delayed but should be available sometime next year. They claim that production models have already been made and are currently undergoing testing in several target areas, but it will not be available to buy just yet. The company are still working on which storage system to use for this device, with Sir Clive's wafer technology one of the options. What is thought to be the first Spectrum clone has been uncovered in Brazil. The TK90X is produced by Micro Digital and is said to be fully compatible with Sinclair's machine. The copyright laws are a bit ropey in Brazil and Micro Digital say they do not have any kind of license whatsoever. Sinclair are aware of the Micro and say they will sue any company trying to import or sell it in the UK. And that was the news. And now on to the top selling games. Coming into the charts this month are BMX Racers from Mastertronic, Devil's Crown, also from Mastertronic, Sky Fox from Areola Soft, Vectron from Firebird. and The Incredible Shrinking Fireman from Mastertronic again. And that was the news and top selling games from March 1986.
Over the last few years, I have always wanted to feature different emulators, something other than the common PC or Mac based emulators that are widely in use today. This is the first one, and I hope to be bringing you more in later episodes. The emulator we're going to take a look at this month is MetroSpec, written by Starquake Limited and is available for Windows phones. There are two versions, there's a free version which is supported by adverts, or you can pay the small fee of 79p to get the ad-free version. The emulator uses the familiar tile layout of Windows phones and gives you a lot of information right from the start. You can get details about each Spectrum model and a bit of history about Sinclair Research. In the settings you have options for graphics, audio, tape and speed loading, controls and emulation settings. Metrospect comes with a set of 25 freeware games ready to play, included Batteries Not Precluded, Berksman, Chopper Drop, Ghost Castle and many more. Each game has its own screenshot to make things easy to select. If you don't want to scroll down the list, you can select a letter, which will use the Windows Phone method of displaying that letter and the games that begin with it underneath him. You can then just select the game. You can import your own games too, from Microsoft's OneDrive or a web URL, and these can be in various formats including SNA, Z80, TAP and TZX. There's also an option to search the WAS archive, and where available, download the games direct. This is a great feature. The emulator at the moment supports 48K and Spectrum Plus machines only, with 1 to 8 support promised soon. Once set up, and you're ready to play. Locate the game you want, and away you go. Loading is instant, with just a slight pause for TAP and TZX files. The Spectrum screen appears at the top of the phone display, with the joypad control at the bottom. The joystick and buttons can be switched if required, which is a handy feature for left hand players, or for those that like their controls in that layout. Metrospec emulates the Kempston joystick, but you can set the controls for individual games really easily. Other options include loading a save state, setting the controls and adding pokes. To start games you normally have to use the keyboard, even if it's just to select a joystick control. Some of the games supplied are not set up for the emulator, which is a bit of a pain, but I suppose each player has their own choice of controls. Speed-wise, Metrospec looked to work at the right speed, at least on my Nokia 930, with things moving smoothly, or at least as smooth as they can on a Spectrum. Originally I couldn't get the emulator to work in landscape mode, and I tried all sorts of things, and in the end it turned out to be my phone. A quick reboot, and everything was fine. Spinning the phone around causes the controls to be overlaid over the full Spectrum screen. This can be quite useful, unless of course the controls cover a part of the screen that's important. Sound-wise, because the 1 to 8 game machines are not yet supported, there's no AY chip. 48k beeper sounds were fine though. Playing games on a small screen will always be an issue especially when pixel perfect control is required, but for simple left-right fire games it was acceptable. Overall then, a fine emulator that still needs some work doing, especially around 1 to 8k machines and the AY sound, but I believe this is in progress. But with a very limited choice of Windows Phone emulators, this is the best you're going to get. This is Blue Thunder, released in 1984 by Richard Wilcox Software, who later went on to form Elite Systems. Although released around the same time as the movie and television series of the same name, this game has nothing to do with them, or at least it doesn't if you read the instructions. 
You are the only survivor of a mighty invasion force, and you have to penetrate the defences of the alien island and destroy the nuclear reactor to be able to rescue your comrades. But wait a minute, if you have comrades then you're not the sole survivor, so that doesn't make much sense, much like the rest of the story. So you're fighting aliens, and what powerful spaceship do you have? Is it a battle cruiser? Nope, it's just a helicopter. Or as the game states, a jet copter. The game is very similar to Harrier Attack. You take off from an aircraft carrier, which I presume is on automatic because you're the sole survivor, remember, and head out across the sea. There are small islands with gun and laser emplacements that take pot shots at you. Some of them are really difficult, if not impossible, to dodge, which makes the game very unfair. The lasers, for example, bend to follow you. Now, I didn't know that lasers could do that. Anyway, once you get further inland, you will eventually come to the reactor, but you can't get to it unless you destroy a sort of bouncy thing. Once that's gone, the reactor pops up from the ground. Now comes the difficult bit. You have to take out the vertical shield first, and then dodge in and out of the force field to blow up the reactor. Once blown up, you can land and pick up your fellow comrades. But watch out for that balloon. Yes, that's right, this is an alien space fighting game, and there are balloons. Okay, that obviously makes sense. Anyway, if you can dodge that, it's back to the carrier. Dodging the laser and cannons that still have power to shoot at you, despite the reactor being blown up. Hmm, I wonder if they're using solar power or maybe hamsters in a wheel or something. Once you land on the carrier, it all starts again, but with an added submarine taking shots at you from the water. You have a fuel limit too, and no way to refuel unless you get back to the carrier. The graphics are okay I suppose, and move smoothly enough, and the sound suits the game. But I can't help thinking that this story was just bolted on to avoid copyright problems, either with the movie, or the TV show, or even Airwolf. Control is a bit odd too. The copter face is right when you start, and to turn it around you have to press and hold the fire key and the direction button at the same time, for varying amounts of time. If you hold it down for a short time, the copter will spin and face you, which means you can shoot up or down. Hold it a little bit longer, and the copter will spin round so it's facing to the left. Hmm, all very odd. And it's also too easy to do this by accident, meaning that your copter is facing completely the wrong direction to fire at anything. Maybe I'm getting to be a bit of an old whinge bag, but a game that tries to stick a real story on top of things and proves to be utter rubbish with nonsensical elements just makes me want to scream. Lasers should not track you, things should not continue to function when you've blown up their power, and the laser turret near the reactor doesn't even fire at you. And even though you're the sole survivor, you're going to rescue your comrades and the carrier is obviously on fully automatic. And there's a balloon that suddenly appears from nowhere and drops bombs on you. Anyway, it could have been a good game this, but for me it just doesn't stand up, either in gameplay or story. Super Hang On was released in the arcades by Sega in 1987, and was the ancestral successor to pole position in many players' eyes. Replacing the car of the aforementioned racer with a motorbike, and providing a near full-size sit-on bike in some versions, this soon became a firm favourite with race fans. There were four tracks, each progressively harder, and the usual time limit restrictions to beat. The arcade game featured beautiful graphics and excellent playability, so how would the Spectrum version compare? Obviously not having the graphics hardware of the arcade, the Spectrum version still manages to deliver a very playable game. The four songs of the arcade version are sadly not available on the Spectrum, and in fact there's no music at all, other than during the track selection stage. The game is a multi-load, starting with the easiest track first. 
Although the game works on 1 to 8k machines, the sound remains the same regardless of which machine you're playing on. The download tap file, if you can find it that is because this game is denied by the publisher, failed to load the beginner's track, so I had to dig out my original tape and do it the old fashioned way. Once loaded you get a pretty bad tune, and an indicator showing you which track you're about to play. Then it's time to race. Control can be via keyboard or various joysticks and you do get an option to change the sensitivity. The feeling is different from the smooth analogue controls of the arcade, but you soon get used to it. The arcade easy track can be ridden with hardly ever touching the brake, and this is mostly true of the Spectrum version too. However, I did think that the Spectrum version was harder. Having got quite far on the arcade version, I struggled sometimes with the specky one. In fact, you can probably see I had trouble completing the first stage, which led to frustration, especially having just played through and enjoyed the arcade version. If you overdo the speed a bit, and are not in a good place to take corners, you have to brake, and this meant that the riders behind you continually crashed into you, meaning that you slowed down even more. It was like a vicious circle at times. The graphics themselves are well drawn, and look like the arcade counterpart, but obviously with less colours. They move smoothly, then the road gives a nice sensation of speed and movement. The bike tilts as you take corners, and should you crash as often as I did, you get a nice animation. Sound, as mentioned already, consists of just the same engine tone, with a few different effects for skidding and crashing. It really does miss the music though, and is better played with some appropriate songs in the background. Playability wise then, it falls behind the arcade machine I think, due to the increased difficulty. Despite playing for ooh, nearly an hour, I never managed to get past the beginner's track, which was slightly embarrassing. The arcade machine had a turbo boost button, and if you hit a certain speed, you could use this, giving you an extra boost. This is replicated in the Spectrum version too, and has to be used if you want to get far in this game. Once your speed gets to about 180 km an hour, the indicator turns red, meaning that you can now use the turbo. This increases your speed, but also means you have to be more careful when approaching corners. Overall then, quite a nice racer, but I think the difficulty could have been dialed down a bit especially as there are other tracks to play, and they didn't have to cram it all into one single load. If you like racers then, you'll probably like this. Go and give it a try. Frankenstein was released by PSS in 1984, and is a platform game that doesn't have any jumping. That may sound strange, but the game was, and still is, an original twist on the genre. The aim of the game is simple. Collect all of the body parts required to build the monster and bring him back to life by switching on the electricity. There are 50 screens of action, and each screen is completed separately. You control the professor who has to move around, collecting the parts. And instead of jumping, there are two methods of moving up and down. At various points, there are small springs which can be used to bounce the professor up to the platform above. And there are also poles that allow the professor to slide down to the platform below. Each one can only be used in one direction, so there is an element of strategy and planning required to complete each level. There are also a lot of other hazards to watch out for, like areas of ice that cause the professor to slide uncontrollably, and bulbs that give him a shock and stop him moving for a short amount of time. On later levels there's also slime that slows him down. The platforms are patrolled by numerous enemies ranging from hypodermic needles, snakes and spiders, 
and all these, of course, are deadly. As the professor walks over the body parts, they vanish from the platform and appear at the top of the screen, and slowly build up the monster. Once they've all been collected, then the switch has to be thrown to bring him to life. If all this wasn't enough, there's a time limit too, and this can be seen by the small meter at the top of the screen. You also have to collect the parts in the right order, so again, you have to plan your route. Some levels do not include collecting parts, and instead you just have to reach the switch at the top. These screens are very reminiscent of Donkey Kong, with the monster stood at the top, throwing barrels at you. Control is by various joysticks or the keyboard, and feels very sharp and responsive. The graphics are well animated and very smooth, and the sound is really nice with some great effects for walking as well as bouncing and sliding up and down. And this is a great game. Surprisingly, it's actually compiled basic. The original game had some bugs, which meant that level 25, if you could ever reach it that is, I never managed it, could not be complete, and some levels crashed randomly. A new error-free version was released in 2011, after the original source code was released by the author. It was fixed and then recompiled. I recommend giving this game a try. I enjoyed it back in 1984, and still have time for it even now. It's a great little game. Go and give it a try. Sea Dragon was released in 2010 by Andrew Zigloff. Although having no background story or even instructions, you pretty much get a feel for the game straight away and anyone who liked the arcade game Scramble will instantly feel at home. You guide your submarine through minefields and caves, armed with just your torpedoes. The screen scrolls smoothly from right to left, and the scattering of mines randomly bob upwards. You control your sub using keyboards or joystick, and have full directional control, but even this makes dodging the mines tricky. You can of course shoot them, and there is an unlimited amount of torpedoes, but you do have a limited amount of air. Each time you drop below the surface, your air begins to deplete. To replenish it, you have to surface again. As you approach the caves, you have to make sure you've got enough air to get through to the other side, as these are all underwater sections, with no place to replenish your supply. The graphics are well drawn, and move really smoothly, and there's some nice bubble effects when you fire your torpedoes. Sound is used well, and there's a nice tune on the intro screen. Gameplay wise I found it a little bit tricky, judging the timings and the amount of space you have is not easy, and it took me a fair few attempts just to reach the first cave system. Here there are added obstacles in the form of gun turrets. And of course the roof of the cave makes manoeuvring even more tricky, and you have to be pixel perfect. There are different levels of difficulty, but I found it very challenging on the lowest, but maybe I'm just rubbish at these sort of games. If you like Scramble then, and are a good game player, give it a go. to playing tips. Today we're going to take a look at Doomstalk's Revenge. 
And this is a bit of a cheat for Doomstalk's Revenge, but if, like me, you, when you were younger you played Doomstalk's Revenge for a long, long time and found that you could never complete the game, this is a way to complete the game and reveal the watchwords of Midnight with the minimum of effort. It uses an interesting feature of Doomstalk's Revenge that, for some reason, the inhabitants of Icemark when Luxor the Moon Prince rides forth into their realm, they decide to go on what can only be described as a hell-bent mutual genocide. So the first thing that you want to do is get Luxor, Tarathel and Rothron all hidden in tunnels and then crank your emulator up to its fastest speed and keep pressing night and dawn and night and dawn. And what happens is, without any intervention from Luxor at all, one of the genocidal inhabitants of Icemark will walk along and stick his sword, or in this case, because it's a barbarian spear, in Shareth the Heartstealer. So that's actually the hardest part of the game done. What I'd advise you to do then is keep your emulator cranked up full speed and keep pressing night and dawn for a bit longer so that everyone wipes everyone else out. The next thing to do is find Morkin, and to do that, get Tarathel to hightail it up to the far northeast of the map and find the Pit of Fildrak. And once she's there, get her to enter that tunnel, then move through that tunnel, and eventually she'll emerge at the other side, coming out at the Palace of Benagria, which is at the other side of the little icy waste barrier that separates Morkin from the rest of the map. She can then look around and in that area and she will eventually find Morkin and is the only character in the game that can recruit him. All that's left to do then is for Tarathel and Morkin to hightail it back to the gate of Verinorn and join up with Luxor and Rothron. When all four of them are at the gate, press Knight and the watchwords will be revealed. And that's a very easy, cheaty way to reveal the watchwords of Midnight in Doomstalk's Revenge. If, like me, you played it for hours and hours and hours as a kid, it got a bit sick of it, thought it wasn't quite as good as Lord of Midnight, or Lords of Midnight, and decided, I really wish there was a quick way to do this, then that's the way to do it. I think someone in a magazine once described it as the same as if Frodo had found his way all the way to Mount Doom only to find out that Sauron had slipped in the bath, cracked his head open and died by another means. So until next time, happy gaming! Welcome to Type In Corner, bringing you games not seen in over 20 years. This month's game is Mind Blaster, written by Kay Clatworthy and released in an October issue of Popular Computing Weekly. The game features two machine code routines, one to invert the screen and the other to scroll the top two thirds. The game involves shooting space mines, but it's not as simple as that. Your mission time is limited and when the counter reaches 500 the game ends. However, firing your laser uses more mission time. So you have to hit as many of the mines at close range as possible and this increases your score and uses less of your time. The graphics are basic as you would expect and sound is very limited. It does vary from other similar games though by having a time limit and a laser that uses that time so this makes you take more risks to get a good score. This is probably the first time this game has been seen since it was first published, and will be available to download from my blog shortly. Thank you.
Welcome to the demo of the month. This month's demo is Excess by Zero International Association, released in 1997. The reason for picking this demo lies with the excellent vector work that it contains. There's hardly any fancy images, no parallax scrolling, no bobs, just solid vectors. And for the spectrum, the maths involved in getting this sort of thing running smoothly must have been very difficult. Some sections of the demo use interlacing to avoid colour clash, and these are tricky to capture on emulation, so part of this footage was grabbed using a camcorder. We start off with some nice interlaced star fields that quickly lead on to some very impressive image manipulation. Next we have more interlacing with a nice grid of mixed colours that looks really nice on a real machine. This is followed by an excellent rotating cube. There's a lot of good work to be seen in this demo, and the music suits it well. The demo does contain a lot of screen flashing, usually in time with the music, and although nice to start with, it can soon play havoc with your eyes. This demo is well worth checking out. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.